Probably most of you know me. Uh, basically, as uh, Phil has said, um, I've got a PhD in zoology, and I've been very interested in this issue of creation and evolution for a long time. And I am a creationist. I won't uh, let you try and guess that. I am a creationist, and I believe the Bible to be true. So we're going to tackle this um, contentious issue. Uh, we call it bones of contention, a contentious issue of the human evolution, or did humans evolve from apes, uh, or are... We descended from ape-like ancestors. That's the question we're going to consider tonight. So we're going to look at really five different things. We're going to be introduced to the family of the hominids. In case you're wondering, you are a hominid, officially speaking. We're going to look at some of the methods that the uh, scientists use to evaluate the fossil hominids and also to evaluate uh, living creatures, living apes, and to see what the relationship is between humans and apes. And we're going to spend a bit of time looking at some of the key fossil hominids. And there's quite a lot of fossil hominids out there, lots of different fragments. I'm afraid the, the, the old joke about uh, the, the bones that support evolution of uh, man from apes could fill a, sm- a good-sized coffin is no longer any good because they've got a bit more now. They could probably fit in the good-sized coffin. You might need two coffins now, but uh, they've got a lot more evidence. It's quite confusing, some of it, which is actually rather important. And we can look at some very new evidence that's actually only come out this year. Since I prepared, I've been preparing some material on uh, human evolution for quite a while, and I wrote uh, a, a short paper on it for a creationist organization back at the beginning of this year in January, and I made a prediction that as more work is done, it will become clearer which are apes and which are human. And shortly after that time, a couple of papers have been published which do just that, and we're going to look at that new, inf- new information, new evidence that's come out just this year. And we're going to have a quick look at genetics, because there's been some new information on the genetics as well, which is quite important when we're considering this question of the origin of humanity. So let's meet the hominids. We're going to look at uh, some fossils from various genus of the hominids. or It must be geni, I suppose, in plural. I didn't do Latin. Basically, a genus is a family. You have different species uh, united under one genus. So Ardipithecus is a genus, and there are two or three species of fossil Uh, creatures which are very ape-like. Then we're going to look at the uh, Australopithecus genus, and there are about three species recognised in that grouping. We're also going to look at genus Homo, which is us. We are Homo sapien. Modern humans are called Homo sapiens, wise men. Uh, Somewhat pretentious, don't you think? But there you go. Uh, At least um, five species, probably as many as nine, depending how you draw your lines and how you divide up your species. And that's actually one of the issues which you often come across in this kind of debate. Where do you decide one species is different from another? Are they the same species? Are they two different species? It's actually quite confusing. So really we're going to try and um, deconstruct, if you like, the evidence that's often presented to us, conclusively proving, we're told, that we evolved from apes. So let's just have a look at the family tree. Here we have... uh, the, some of the key players in the hominid family tree. We have the gorilla, we have the chimpanzee, and we have human beings. And the evolutionists tell us we're all related in some sort of family tree. And we've got various uh, linking fossils, transitional fossils, we're told, which uh, tie it all together. Uh, or is actually the reality more like this, where we have separate lines. In fact, you've got gorillas, you've got humans, you've got chimpanzees. And what evidence have we got to, show to, to support that claim, which is the alternative claim? So let's have a look at uh, how we actually analyse the fossils. There are lots of different ways that anthropologists or uh, paleontologists look at the fossils. And when studying human fossils, there are a few key factors which are very important. One thing, that, one way of analysing the fossils is to look at the humerofemoral index. It's basically the, the ratio of the length of your uh, thigh bone to your uh, upper arm bone. They also look at brain size. The, the story goes that we started out with small-brained uh, apes and we've got to large-brained human beings. So we're going to look at some of that evidence very briefly. We're going to look at knuckle-walking, which is a feature of an ape, ape's knuckle-walk. And we're going to think about brachiation. Brachiation is basically swinging from one hole to another with your arms, like a chimpanzee does. And we're going to have a quick look at the semicircular canal as well, because the semicircular canal is actually very important in trying to distinguish between apes and humans because the semicircular canal is related to the way you move around, and apes actually move around in a different way from which uh, people move around. So we're going to look at these five pieces of evidence 
Let's have a look now at the humerofemoral index. Here we have a skeleton, and here is the, the femur, and here is the humerus. If you're human, your femur is longer than your humerus. If you're an ape, it's the other way around. So you can actually get data. This is what the, the paleontologists do. Here's an extract from a paper where they looked at the, the ratio of the femur to the humerus, plot it out in a graph, and these are the various creatures that are included on this graph. So you've got homo, which is humans, you've got uh, chimpanzees, two different types of chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan, and various fossils. And here is a line which uh, is the ratio of one, in other words, the femur and the humerus are the same length, so you get a ratio of one. And above the line you have the apes, and below the line you have humans, and in the middle here you actually have some fossil uh, creatures as well as, no I don't think you have anything else besides fossils. You only have fossil creatures on the, actually on the line. So it looks like, from all the evidence we have, that if you're an ape, or if you're a fossil ape, it might be a bit contentious that claim, but I'm claiming that fossil apes as well, uh, have an index between 1 and 1.3. 1.3 is up here, this is 1, and about 0.7 is human. And here are the human beings with uh, 0.7. And in here actually is a fossil human called um, Homo erectus. But we'll come on to that, we'll come back to that. Brain size. Basically you have a primate brain which can vary from, if we consider all, all us, we're all primates, let's uh, for the sake of our argument consider ourselves all primates, I would actually argue that we're not primates, we're humans and there are primates. But let's follow, I'm going to take actually mostly the evolutionist reasoning and show you how it falls down. So I'm going to reason like an evolutionist and consider that we're all primates. So the primate brain volume goes from about 350 mil for a chimp to about 1,300 mil for a human being. And uh, here's a, uh, some re recent data summarising the current knowledge of brain volume. Here you have your chimpanzees and your gorillas, quite small brain size, going all the way up to actually uh, about uh, 650. Here you have what's a creature called Homo habilis, which is a bit like the, the gorilla in brain size. And up here you have various different Homo erectus uh, fossils, where they have the skull, they can actually measure the brain volume. And there's quite a variety here. It's actually a very large variation, which in fact to me suggests that they're mixing up more than one species together. Because if you look at human beings, your, your variation is much smaller, the same with chimpanzees and gorillas. So if you take modern creatures and look at the brain size, they're pretty consistent. You take the fossils, you've got a massive spread, which is unusual. And these, these creatures here in the middle are very recently described this year in, in Nature. They have an article about them, which uh, actually confused the picture somewhat for the evolutionist. So here we have a, a story goes that from chimpanzees, or from apes rather, with small brains, you gradually evolve towards a creature which has a large brain, and that becomes human. But we're going to look at uh, some of those assumptions a bit later on. Let's just explain what, what we mean by knuckle walking. Now, if somebody tells you great apes are quadrupeds, you have uh, every right to uh, um, correct them, because apes, great apes are not quadrupeds. They do not walk around on four legs. Uh, if anything, they walk around four arms, because apes tend actually have uh, four hands. Because you see them climbing a tree, you can see they've got hands on their, where their feet are. So, but they walk in a quadruped-like fashion. And here's a picture of a gorilla. I believe it's carrying a baby gorilla up here on this lump on the back. And it's walking around on its feet and on its knuckles. <coughs> and the wrist bones are actually diagnostic. You can actually look at the wrist bones of an ape. You can look at the wrist bones of a fossil. They can take the fossil wrist bones. And you can work out whether they were knuckle walkers or not by the way they're constructed. They've actually got specialised scaphoid and radius bones. The radius bone is basically a large bone in your forearm, and the scaphoid is the first bone that connects your forearm to your hand, part of your wrist. And here the arrow is where the scaphoid is. And here's a diagram of a chimpanzee knuckle walking. And what happens actually during knuckle walking is the wrist locks into place. Our wrists don't lock into place, they flop around. You can pretend to be an ape and pretend to knuckle walk, but you're not, because your wrist does not lock into place in the right position. And this is actually designed to lock into place, just like our knees are designed to lock into place. And that's, that is knuckle walking. If you're just walking around on four limbs without having a, a wrist that locks into place, you cannot, you're not qualify as a knuckle walker. 
Right, brachiation, let's just think quickly about brachiation. Brachiation is moving by swinging the arms from one hole to another, like you might do on a horizontal ladder if you want to get fit and do some exercise, or like you see the chimpanzees do in the zoo. Here's a, here's a chimpanzee uh, brachiating, or running out of holes here. And to do this efficiently, it helps have curved finger bones. Our finger bones are straight, but chimpanzees and gorillas and fossil apes have curved finger bones. Here's a, a picture of some fossil finger bones, and they're actually curved, and that helps you keep hold because you're not just relying on strength, on just muscle to keep yourself there because you, your hands actually operate like a hook. You also need specialised shoulder design to actually have your arm in the right position because we can, do, we can brachiate moderately well but not very well. Uh, chimpanzees and apes can do it all day, all day long without getting tired. We can't because our, our shoulders are not designed correctly. So you can actually look at the shoulder, you can look at the finger bones and you can tell whether a creature moved by brachiation or not. Now, why are semicircular canals important? Well, semicircular canals are very important. If you didn't have semicircular canals, you wouldn't be able to walk around. You'd be falling over all the time. If you know people who suffer from uh, Menier's syndrome where they have problems with their semicircular canals, they can't balance, they just fall over for no apparent reason because basically they can't tell they're standing upright or not. And our, our semicircular canals are an organ of position and sometimes described actually as a sixth sense. Uh, it's described as a separate sense. And here's a diagram of semicircular canals. They're basically in your ear, what's the inner ear, behind your eardrum, uh, and in, embedded in the bone of your skull, you have semicircular canals. And there are three semicircular canals oriented uh, 90 degrees to each other so that you can tell whether you're standing upright or lying down or moving forward or moving backwards. And they help you to balance and help you to position yourself in space. Now, an ape actually has a semicircular canal. It's configured for tree climbing. Now, I haven't got time this evening to go into all the evidence to show you how that works, but we'll look at some of the, the information that's been collected a bit later on. And humans have a different set configuration of the semicircular canals, which is actually configured for bipedal walking, walking around on two legs. And more importantly, it's configured so that we can run. Now, humans are one of the few creatures that can run around on two legs. Now, apes can walk after a fashion but they certainly can't run, and they certainly can't run a marathon. Human beings are designed to run marathons for some reason. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the answer to that would be, so don't ask me afterwards why human beings are designed to run marathons. I have no idea. Uh, same reason horses are designed to run forever. Uh, maybe it's just for fun. But basically, if you're going to run, you need your semicircular canal configured for that. Semicircular canals have to be configured in a certain way to do that. So you do actually, you can actually do objective measures of the orientation, the size of the semicircular canals, and work out whether you have a creature that's designed to move around in the trees and move around as a knuckle walker or to move around bipedally standing upright. And people have looked at a gentleman called Fred Spohr, who's a Dutchman who's done a lot of work on semicircular canals, and he basically gets his CAT scanner out, puts skulls inside the CAT scanner, fossil skulls, modern skulls, and looks at the semicircular canals, and he's done quite a lot of published work on, on that, and he's looked at fossils like um, Homo erectus and shown conclusively that they have a semicircular canal just like human beings. He's looked at Australopithecus and uh, shown that they have a semicircular canal that is the same as the modern apes that move by, through the trees and move by knuckle walking. So that's a, a very rapid tour of some of the techniques that paleontologists used uh, to analyse the fossils and try and work out their lifestyle and the way they moved and the way they lived. Let's try and work out whether they have characteristics that are human or ape-like, or a mixture of the two. So let's look at some of the fossils. We'll start with Ardipithecus. By the way, Pithecus means ape, in case you're wondering. So this is a, uh, an ape from the Ardi, um, the Ardi region of Africa. That's probably not the right uh, pronunciation, but it's an ape from that region. And it's an ape-like animal. Nobody uh, contests that. That's uncontroversial. Uh, but they are rather fragmentary. There's not very much good fossils, very many good fossils for this, um, this uh, creature. And here are some of the fragments you get. So a few bits and pieces, teeth and all the rest of it, uh, teeth and a few bones, leg bones, a bit of a jaw. Not very much evidence, but um, they are believed, they're about the size of a modern chimpanzee on the basis of the fragments that we can find. And they're believed to be the ancestors of the Australopithecines, which means southern ape, in case you're wondering. And some people try to maintain that they were bipedal, but the evidence is a bit shaky, so I don't think anybody's going to stake their career on claiming that Ardipithecus was bipedal. But they are claimed to have ape-like tra ape -like traits and um, 
astralopithecine-like traits. But actually, um, <clears throat> the evidence from the spinal column and the way the head attaches to the spinal column suggests that they were not completely bipedal. So that's Ardipithecus, supposedly in our family tree. But I think it's an extinct ape, and I think the evidence is fairly strong to show that it, well, it's extinct and it's an ape. Uh, an ape. Uh, the question about whether it's an ancestor of human beings is debatable. I just want to mention uh, uh, Tumai, if that's the correct pronunciation, um, another fossil that was quite uh, re- discovered a couple of years ago. It has a relatively small cranium, in other words, a relatively small skull. Here's a picture of the skull. It's, it's a reasonably complete skull. The interesting thing about it, it's got quite a flat face, which is a characteristic of being human. So people have suggested that actually this might be a human ancestor because it had a flat face. Uh, it had a, there's only been five pieces of jaw, bone, and some teeth. Brain case is quite small, a small brain, about 150 mil in volume, we would suspect, from what evidence we have. Unfortunately, there are no bones below the skull, so we can't really tell very much about how it moved about. And, but uh, some people have basically concluded that this is a type of gorilla. Looking at the features of the skull, uh, evolutionists have decided that it's probably actually uh, a gorilla or a chimpanzee. And the claim that it could be related to human beings is not very easy to uh, substantiate. Let's come on to uh, Australopithecus, which is arguably the most famous, most well-known fossil uh, ape, suggested to be a human ancestor, considered even today to be the most likely candidate for a human ancestor. And the most famous uh, Australopithecus is uh, Lucy, codenamed AL2881, Lucy. And here she is, uh, not very much of her actually, and it's even debatable whether she was female or not. Uh, there's been some discussion about that recently, uh, suggesting that maybe it wasn't female after all, but we won't, don't want to spoil a good story. We'll call her Lucy. Everyone knows who you're talking about. Found in 1974, so quite a while ago, in Ethiopia. But all the evidence actually suggests that it was able to move three different ways. So it's actually got a mix of characters. It has fingers and feet, which suggest it could have been very good at climbing trees just like a modern ape. But it also has wrists and fingers which are consistent with knuckle walking, also like the great apes. But its pelvis, the the hip bones, of which there are about half the hip is here, slightly over half the hip, uh, suggests that it could have walked upright as well. So we have a creature which seems to be able to move three different ways, uh, moving through trees by brachiation, moving by knuckle walking, and actually being able to stand upright and walk around upright as well. Then recent, more recently than that, uh, in uh, 2006, there was a publication of uh, a group of workers, including uh, Fred Spohr, who does all his work with the CT scans on the um, semicircular canals, and he, they discovered a fossil which they're calling the Dakika baby. Uh, and this is believed to be also called Lucy's baby, because it's a baby Australopithecus. Juvenile skeleton, probably about uh, three years old, they reckon, and here's the, here's the skull and some of the shoulder, uh, shoulder bones on here. And uh, it's, it's, it's a find that is still being investigated. They've basically chipped away the rock from the skull and some of the uh, upper part of the, the skeleton. And it's still working on the legs and uh, some of the arms. But So it's sort of work in progress. But one bone they did come across, which they had uh, found before in a fossil ape, is the, uh, the voice box bone or the the uh, hyoid bo- bo- bone, which is the only bone in your body which isn't attached to another bone, sits in the front of your windpipe and it forms part of your voice box. You can actually measure various dimensions on the voice box on this bone and plot out some graphs. So what these researchers did when they found this bit of bone, they said, well, let's look at this, let's analyse it, and they're going to compare it with gorilla and chimpanzees and humans. And here you have the humans. So we've got all the blue uh, diamond shapes are humans. You've got a, a, a regression line going through here. And here you have chimpanzees and gorillas, and the, the triangle here... Yeah, we'll go back. The triangle here is this uh, fossil. So the conclusion is, actually, it's just like a gorilla or a chimpanzees, and the conclusion from that is they would not be able to speak, these creatures. So Australopithecus would have been unable to communicate as a human being would communicate. But interesting to note that it's actually... Very, sits very closely with chimpanzees. It's not a transition between chimpanzees and humans. It sits in there, right up with the apes. Another piece of bone they found was a shoulder blade, 
which was very useful for looking at the way the shoulder was constructed because you, you might remember the way you work out whether you can brachiate or not is looking at your shoulder as well as your fingers. And they did that also find finger bones and the finger bones were curved. Here is, here is, is the shoulder blade of this fossil. And uh, next to it you've got a gorilla and a chimpanzee. And you can basically draw a line through this axis and work out from that what you're most similar to and the fossil Dikika has a line which is pretty much identical to the gorilla there's no there's no difference between that it's slightly slightly less sloping if you like but there's pretty much nothing in it and the human is the last one here and uh, this line is actually horizontal so the way our, sh our arm attaches to our shoulder is different from a chimp different from a gorilla and different from this uh, Dikika baby this Australopithecine so the conclusion here is that it was able to swing through the trees much like a gorilla or a chimpanzee. And you can actually plot out various parameters, which is what the researchers did, just to show it much more conclusively. Uh, here they have, here's the data they produced. They analysed human shoulder blades and uh, human uh, gr gorilla and chimpanzee as well. G is gorilla, P is uh, pan for chimpanzee. And the, this D here is the... Uh, Dikika shoulder, and right in with the gorillas. Human beings are up here. So completely different, again, from the human condition. So this uh, Lucy's baby, as they call it, allows us to make some preliminary conclusions on uh, Australopithecus. It had a gorilla-like shoulder blade. It also had the long curved finger bones. So they were curved like hooks so they could... Uh, grip the trees, uh, tree branches very efficiently. So it would have been very efficient at brachiation, swinging through the trees like a chimpanzee or gorilla or orangutan. But they've also unearthed the foot and some of the lower limb, and from that they suggested it was bi it could walk around bipedally, so it could stand up on two legs and walk around. Again, how well it could do that is an open question, and there's no uh, clear way to determine whether it could walk like a human being for long distances or not. But the fact that it is designed also to brachiate suggests that it would have used a mixture of uh, modes of locomotion, just like Lucy would have done. In other words, it can brachiate, it can use knuckle walking, and also move around bipedally if it wished to. And that was uh, 2006. That was published, September 2006, just over a year ago. But this year, uh, in 2007, earlier this year, somebody analysed the, uh, the ramus of Lucy, What's the ramus? The ramus element is actually part of your mandible, your lower jaw, and it's the bit that attaches your lower jaw to the rest of your skull. Here's a picture of the, the mandible of Lucy and another Australopithecus uh, afarensis, which is the same species as Lucy, and the ramus is uh, this bit circled here. And here we have a human uh, jawbone, and as you can see, I hope very clearly, the ramus is remarkably different from that of Lucy. What you've got here, where the arrows are pointing, this is the, um, the coronoid process of the ramus. And here in human beings, it's, it's quite narrow at the, t at the end. So it's triangular. But here in Lucy, it's more sort of uh, arch-shaped, so much wider, so it maintains the same width all the way up. And then you've got have to look at the notch here. This is called the, um, the notch, the mandibular notch. And in humans, it's quite wide and V-shaped, whereas in Lucy and other Australopithecus species, it is more narrow and U-shaped. So the conclusion here is, and this morphology, this, the, shaping, the shaping of the um, ramus is very similar to that seen in gorillas. And this is a conclusion I'm quoting from the paper. The presence of the morphology in both Australopithecus robustus, which is another type of uh, southern ape, more, more, more robust, larger, stronger built than the, the afarensis. And its absence in modern humans actually casts doubt on the role of Lucy as a common ancestor. So these researchers are actually saying, and this is a publication for you if you want to go and check it out, it's in the um, publication, uh, so what, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science of the US of A, published in April 2007, and by these gentlemen. And they concluded that actually, this suggests that Lucy couldn't have been a common ancestor of human beings. And that's not a creationist saying this. And it just goes to show how 
when you're looking at the, the, the debate about human origins and all the fossils that you find, and you get the big splash headline in the paper saying, we found the missing link. They're still looking for it. But they still call it the missing link. We found the missing link. Here it is. Uh, but then a few years later, they do a bit more analysis. They get a few more fossils, and they, they refine their techniques, and suddenly they say, well, actually, no, we're not convinced anymore. It doesn't seem to be the missing link. So this is actually what's happening to Lucy at the moment, although, of course, the, uh, the jury is still out. But these people have published this research, which looks fairly convincing, suggesting that, at least in this as far as this feature is concerned, it doesn't appear to be in the li lineage of humans. It's more likely to be in the lineage of gorillas. So Lucy more likely to be the, uh, the ancestor of gorillas. So it's quite amazing how things change as they look at more evidence. And another example of that is Homo rudolfensis, which we were told uh, is an ancestor to human beings. Discovered by the famous Dr. Leakey, who's done a lot of work on human evolution, we're told it's 1.9 million years old, so not human, can't be human, because it's too old. Uh, but the question still remains, is it ape or human? And here's a reconstruction from the original publication by Dr. Leakey, and he basically put the skull back together, the various fragments, in this way. But a gentleman called uh, Dr. Bromage has come along and done some computer reconstruction based on various rules that he's devised from looking at actual skulls, complete skulls, and the way the, the, face, the, the bones of the face fit together, the location of the eyes, the ears, and the mouth, and discovered certain rules. And he's reanalyzed the fossil, and here's his reanalysis on the left-hand side, and he shows the face sticking out at an angle, which is ape, an ape-like feature. So this was published in March uh, 2007, and his conclusion was actually that based on the, that uh, actually the reconstruction by Dr. Leakey was biased based on erroneous preconceived expectations of early human appearance that actually violated the principles of craniofacial development, in other words, the way your skull and face is put together, and the way it actually develops and grows as you develop and grow as an individual. So he's, he's challenging this interpretation on the basis of fairly objective evidence. And again, he's not a creationist, he's a, an evolutionary scientist. And he concludes that they were more like uh, two archaic ape-like hominids, the uh, Australopithecines and uh, another one called Paranthropus. So he's again demoted Humo Rudolfensis, really, from the human lineage. He shouldn't be called Homo anymore. It's probably more likely to be uh, some sort of uh, Australopithecus. And again, that can be looked up. Uh, if you want to know the reference for that, I can provide you with the references for that article. And so it looks like Homo rudolfensis was nothing of the sort. It wasn't human. It was an extinct ape. Moving on to another member of the uh, so-called uh, human family tree, we have Homo habilis. Homo habilis is actually one of the most contentious uh, species in this story. And evolutionists admit that uh, it's actually very difficult to define. And some people have concluded it's actually just a, a mishmash. Here's a, one of the, a habilis skull, which is fairly complete, which is quite useful, but it is quite ape-like uh, in features. But some people, even evolutionists, have said it's actually a mishmash of different traits and specimens. And some are similar to Australopithecus, and others are like Homo erectus, which... I would uh, suggest, is actually human. So it's not very clear wh what we've got here. There's a bit, bit of a mixture, there's a bit of debate, and there's still debate about where these guys fit. And the brain size varies from about 600 to 700 mil, so quite small, smaller than a human being. But I would suggest to you that this is some gibbon-like ape. And Fred Spohr actually did some analysis of Homo habilis skull and looked at the semicircular canals and he concluded that it was adapted for uh, arboreal climbing, in other words, climbing around in trees. He published that work in 1994. And he concluded that uh, Homo habilis could not be considered an uh, obligate biped. In other words, it was not a creature that has to walk around on two legs like we do. We are obligate bipeds. We have no choice. It's very uncomfortable to walk around any other way. Uh, whereas this creature would have been quite comfortable walking around on its knuckles, knuckle walking. So Homo habilis are a very contentious species, but actually some more evidence has come out recently which does help, but not a great deal. Now let's have a look at Homo erectus, or sometimes called uh, also Homo ergaster. Uh, basically the erectus are the African variety and ergaster is the Asian variety, and there's a lot of debate about which came first and where they came from. It's all rather complicated. But uh, what we can say about it is 
First discovered in the 1800s and is called uh, uh, Pithecanthropus erectus, is otherwise known as Java Man. Uh, one time quite contentious, but most people nowadays accept that uh, the, the find is probably uh, uh, correct. But we now call it Homo erectus. And here we have a creature which has actually him, human limb proportions. So their, their uh, femur is longer than their humerus. So their legs are longer than their arms, which is a human characteristic, whereas you remember apes have arms longer than their legs. Brain volume is about 900 mil. Uh, human brain volume generally varies from about one litre, in other words, 1,000 mil, up to about uh, two litres, somewhere in that range. Most of us sort of sit somewhere in the middle. And if you're a lady, your brain is slightly smaller than the men, which doesn't actually make you less intelligent, which is worth bearing in mind. <clears throat> and here is a picture of one of the very famous Homo erectus. Uh, this is uh, what the, a creature called the Narakotomi boy, found in Kenya in 1984, and it is basically described as something having very modern human features, but we're going to call it a separate species because we think it's got some slight differences, but it, it's highly debatable as to whether you can do that. I mean, you can't really say on the basis of a few differences that is a separate species. Uh, it really is a case of, I believe, the evolutionists forcing this into uh, a criterion that suits their story of evolving from a small uh, ape-like creature into human being. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the, um, the late early footprints. Very famous fossil, well, it's not actually a fossil, it's an imprint. These, these we are told, are three million years old. Uh, human beings, by the way, proper human beings are reckoned to have existed for about 100,000 years only in an evolutionary time scale. So let's just give you the context. Here's a picture of the place where you can find these, these Latoli footprints. In other words, they're in Latoli. And there are a series of footprints. Here's a, a large blown-up picture of one. And th they are claimed to be made by Australopithecus afarensis because that was a creature that was around at the time that they, they, people believe could walk around on two feet. Unfortunately, the, some researchers have recently analysed the, one of the bones in the foot, the navicular, the diagram of the foot for you to show where your navicular bone is. Here it is. It's actually a very important part of your foot because it, it makes the arch of your feet. We have arched feet, and the navicular bone, the shape of the navicular bone, determines the fact that you have an arch or not. And if you don't have a navicular bone, you don't have an arched foot, you have a flat foot. And what they found was the afarensis navicular is... That, is designed for flat-footed animals, a bit more like an ape than a human. And the conclusion was that uh, Australopithecus afarensis almost certainly did not walk like us, for starters, and like the hominids at the Toli. And what they've also did is they, they basically took somebody who doesn't habitually wear shoes, make them walk around in sand, and you get prints just like you find at the Toli. So these prints look human, but they are attributed to... Um, Australopithecus, because humans weren't around three million years ago. They're logical, consistent. Well, maybe the three million years is wrong, or maybe the whole time scale is wrong. So that's the Latoli footprints, which is, are quite controversial because they look as though they've been made by a modern human being walking around in some sand. Indistinguishable from, indistinguishable from modern human footprints, basically. Can't do a talk on human evolution without mentioning this guy, Homo floresiensis otherwise called the Hobbit. Here's a skull of the Hobbit, a rather interesting creature, about one metre in height, hence uh, called the Hobbit, but they seem to be bipedal, they seem to be able to stand upright. They had a, uh, the brain volume is about 380 mil, which is rather small, uh, certainly not human, more like an ape. It didn't have a chin. Uh, another characteristic of humans which apes do not share is we all have chins. If you look at the jaw of an ape, it doesn't have a chin. You can see the chin... An ape doesn't have that, it just comes down, round, no chin. So if you have a chin, you're human. If you don't have a chin, you're not human. So just check yourselves out when you go to bed tonight in the mirror. If you've got a chin, you can be happy you're a human being. But this creature did not have a chin, which does make it debatable as to whether it should be called homo at all. Uh, so this is another piece of evidence which is new and still evolving, if you like. Uh, new bones are being dug up. People keep going back to the same place in the Indonesia and digging up more remains. But uh, it's very recent. The conventional dating puts it at about 12,000 years. But So it can't really be evidence for the evolution of humans from apes. 
And some people are now suggesting, I was just reading something on the internet recently, that this possibly has descended from uh, the Australopithecus. So there's a lot of debate about this creature, whether it was human or not. Uh, it's certainly very strange, only one metre high and very small-brained. I just want to mention one other fossil which illustrates some of the issues around this, uh, this subject. This one only has a number. It's called AL666. It's an interesting number. One. I've not noticed that before. It just came to me when I was reading it. And it's the maxilla, which is your upper jaw. Mandible, lower jaw, maxilla, upper jaw. Found by a gentleman called um, William uh, Kimball in Hadar in Ethiopia again, where lots of these fossils are being found. And it's been dated to uh, 2.3 million years. The interesting thing about it is it's pretty much indistinguishable from a Homo sapien jaw. But it can't be Homo sapien. We know that because it's too old. So we have a problem. And this is often the case. The Toli footprints is another example where you have very modern feet wandering around 3 million years ago. It doesn't actually fit the scenario. So that's the fossils. We're now going to look at some genetics. We are told, confidently, by a lot of people still today, surprisingly, they're still doing it today, that we are about 99.5% similar to apes in our genes. You took our genes, uh, maybe a bit less than that. But uh, a gentleman or a team of workers led by a gentleman called Nelson, in fact, no, it wasn't. Nelson wrote a review of the paper. Uh, well, lady, Mrs. Nelson, or Miss Nelson, wrote this uh, review in Nature in two, 2004 in May, and the title was Chimp Chromosome Creates Puzzles. So the idea is, you know, you analyse a chimp chromosome, you, you take the, uh, the human chromosome we've already, already um, decoded, and you compare the two, and you can prove evolution. Uh, so they took the bits that line up, and surprisingly, 1.4... 4% of the individual base pairs were different, uh, which is not surprising if you take the bits of line up. The bits that match, match, basically, is what they're saying. Uh, and therefore, ah, we've proved it, 1.5% different between apes and humans. Well, then if you look at the bits that don't match up, you have a problem, because they found also that 83% of the of 203 genes... Sorry, I should have said this is for chromosome 22 of the chimpanzee, which supposedly matches chromosome 21 of the humans. So they took, looked at the 231 genes on these, this chromosome and they found that 83% had differences. Quite small some of them, quite major others, but 20% showed significant structural changes. So in other words, if you decode that bit of DNA and turn it into a protein, you've got a different protein structure than you had previously. So that's 20%. That's quite a big difference. That was only one chromosome. So maybe uh, when they analyse the rest of the, the, rest of the uh, chromosomes, of which there are 60, uh, sorry, 48 in chimpanzees and other apes and only 46 in humans, which is an interesting question which I'm not going to go into, but you might like to think about how an ape with 48 chromosomes becomes a human with 46. It's more difficult than you think. <clears throat> That's why I call this the myth of 1%. And Cohen, wrote, writing in Science in June this year, wrote about analysis of various stretches of DNA, and he basically concluded that there are stretches of DNA that have been inserted or deleted from the genomes. In other words, if you compare the chimp from the human, to get from one to the other, you have to insert and delete different bits of the gene. I would, of course, argue that the, no, no deletions or insertions have occurred. They're just different. But the evolutionary take on it is, well, we've evolved from chimpanzee, we've evolved from apes, rather, so therefore the bits of the genome has to be switched around. And then uh, a group of workers led by uh, Demuth, or Demuth, however he pronounces his name, published online, there's this journal here, PLOS One, I can't remember what that stands for, but again, uh, December last year. And they did a lot of analysis of human and chimpanzee genomes, and they found differences in 1,418 out of 22,000 genes. Just to save you from adding that up, that's 6.4%. So that is the latest best figure of the difference between humans and chimps in terms of DNA. We are actually 6.4% different, not 1.5% different. And that's the latest data. <coughs> So the story gets more complicated. In fact, the 1.5 is uh, one of the biggest scandals in uh, human evolutionary research ever, based on some very dodgy data produced about 20 years ago. But these things happen. Okay, let's talk about gorillas for a while, because gorillas are supposed to be in our family tree. Uh, again, a, a very recent publication. This is in um, this year. I haven't got the month, but quite recently this year. 
a couple of months ago, I believe this was. The oldest gorilla has been unearthed. Uh, there we go. Uh, Nature 2007, volume 444. And they found eight molar teeth and a canine tooth. Often uh, you wonder about evolution. You think they seem to be describing the evolution of teeth. And you get the impression that these teeth mated and produced baby teeth. And these teeth look like this and they evolved into different teeth. And the creature that fit, fitted the teeth is neither here nor there. And it's a bit like this with this story. Here we have a, a modern gorilla jaw down the bottom. And these teeth that they found, they actually match up very precisely with the teeth of a modern gorilla. Which is all very well. Except we're told that humans and gorillas split off somewhere around 7 million years ago. This creature, unfortunately, is about 10 or 11 million years old. So we had gorillas, modern gorillas, it looks like. Well, you can't tell the difference, but admittedly we've only got the teeth. That uh, existed before the split predicted by the genetics. So according to the geneticists, we split off from gorillas about 7 million years ago. But no, the fossils say differently uh, 10, 11 million years ago. So this looks to suggest that gorillas have been gorillas for the last 11 million years, and they've evolved into gorillas, to uh, paraphrase uh, John Mackay. <clears throat> so gorillas existed long before the split between gorilla and human predicted by genetics. So another problem for the evolutionist. The story doesn't seem to be holding up very well. And this is all very recent evidence. So I'd like to really try and summarise what I've been saying. And ask, what does the evidence actually show? from what we've seen. Now, I have been selective, and you can probably come back to me afterwards and say, but what about this, what about that? Well, actually, it doesn't make a lot of difference. But we can have a discussion about that if you wish. But it does show discontinuity. And there are advanced features too early, for example, uh, this jaw 666 and the Toli footprints. These advanced features were far too early. They were, they were millions of years before they should have been in existence. And that creates problems for the evolutionary scenario. And another bit of very recent evidence, too, published uh, again uh, a couple of months ago in Nature, 2007, is a suggestion that actually Erectus and Habilis were contemporaries. Now, up until now, the evolutionary story has been that Ardipithecus evolved into Habilis, evolved into, uh, sorry, Ardipithecus evolved into Australop Australopithecus, into Habilis, into Erectus, into human. And here we now have, they, they seem to be contemporaries. They're actually now considered to be, according to some of the latest evidence, Parallel lines, so they weren't related at all. They're moving together in different directions. And um, this recent evidence, which I showed you from the, uh, the Ramus of Lucy, showing that the Australopiths, the southern apes, are not related to humans after all. They're more, they're more closely related, it appears, to gorillas. And then we have the, uh, the oldest gorilla, which is 11 million years old, which existed before the split predicted by the geneticists. So again, another problem for, for this branching tree. The branching tree doesn't seem to be branching anymore. You've got gorillas leading up to gorillas. You've got a uh, suggestion that the Lucy was a, uh, an ancestor or an ancient gorilla. And Erectus and Habilis are split off into two separate groups altogether, if Habilis exists as a single group. And these advanced features which suggest that they think the story is not quite what we're told sometimes. And finally, we look at the genetics. We've actually got significant genetic differences. The, the distance between chimps and humans has suddenly enlarged from 1.5% to 6.4%. And that's a fairly major difference when we consider that you're only 50% different from, different from banana. And then the fact that the chimpanzees like bananas has nothing to do with it. <coughs> compare and contrast. This is what you are asked to do when you're at school. Write the essay, Compare and Contrasting. We're going to compare and contrast some of the fossils and some of the modern uh, apes, the great apes as they're called, uh, with human beings. First of all, let's have a look at the fossils and the chimp and gorilla. We have the humerofemoral index, and we have 1, 1, 2, 1.2, 1.2, <laughs> around about 1 if you're a, 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 a Lucy or you're a Homo habilis or you're a chimp or a gorilla. Brain size, you've got brain sizes going up to about 600 mils, maybe a bit more than that. It's just average sizes, so you've got a bit of variation on either side. So brain size, fairly small, half or less than a human being. Did these creatures knuckle walk? We've got definite evidence to show that, the, that Lucy was a knuckle walker. Habilis, we're not really sure about. Chimps, yes. Gorillas, yes. Brachiation, could these creatures brachiate? Could they swing from hole to hole in a tree? And these four creatures all could do that. The semicircular canals have been analysed for all these creatures. And I've got bipedal, two bits of evidence from the semicircular canals. Was the creature bipedal? Well, yes, partially. These creatures could stand up and walk around bipedally on the basis of their semicircular canals. 
Uh, but were there semicircular canals more importantly adapted to an arboreal or moving around in the trees? Yes, they were, all four. <clears throat> so I would suggest to you that we have here a collection of apes, some fossil, some living, and some possibly ancestors of the living ones. <coughs> <coughs> And here we have erectus of modern humours, the uh, humour ephemeral index, 0.7, 0.7. Brain size, slightly less than a, a litre and slightly more than a litre. Could they knuckle walk? No, neither of them were knuckle walkers. Uh, were they able to brachiate? No, the, the, the shoulder blades uh, and the fingers are not typical of uh, creatures that brachiate. And semicircular canals, bipedal, yes, they were obligate bipeds. They had to walk around on, on their two feet and not, not considered to be adapted to an arboreal lifestyle. We're not designed to move around the trees. So I would suggest to you that we have apes which basically have three modes of locomotion. They can walk by walk around sort of like us, but if you look, ever see an ape walk, they don't walk with straight legs. Their legs are bent, their feet, their feet are splayed out because they can't bring their knees in forward, and they don't do it for very long because it's very uncomfortable because they can't actually straighten their leg and lock their knees. If we stand up, you can stand for hours because you can actually lock your knee into place. An ape can't do that. Also, their pelvis is not correctly adjusted, so they actually have to lean forward. So if they lock their knees, they'd end up falling over backwards. So they can't physically do it. So that's a big difference between, between the, the way the legs are put together, not to mention the size. So you have a group of creatures that can move around in three different ways, and a group of creatures that can only move around in one way, in other words, walking or running. And they have very similar architecture in their legs and arms. The brain size, well, we don't really know what the minimum size for a human brain is to actually be a human. And most people who work on the, on the structure of brains and the way the brains work agree that it's, it's the way the brain is organised that's much more important than size. And there are some people around, I've been looking around on the internet trying to find evidence for the smallest size human, and I haven't been able to find it. The smallest size human brain, but I suspect it's quite small, way below the average. And I would argue that erectus is in the modern human range. So, concluding, the evidence is actually consistent with discontinuity, but it's actually been interpreted according to an evolutionary paradigm. What's happened is, you have the evolutionary story, we evolved from apes, which was invented by Charles Darwin, on the basis of very little evidence, and the story goes that we evolved from chimps, so you have, or apes, with small brains, not able to walk upright, and... If, if we're going to get from a, an ape to a human being, you have to go through certain changes. You have to change, up, change from walking around on your knuckles to walking around on two feet. You have to adapt your, your semicircular canals. You have to get, grow a larger brain. You're, also, your hands change because an ape has not got such fine control over his hands as we have. And you've got a whole load of changes which you would fit into an evolutionary scenario. So what's happened is you get fossils and they're basically forced into the chain of events that has been predicted rather than flowing from the evidence itself. There's nothing in the evidence itself that suggests that there has to be a transition. And some of the evidence I've shown you, I hope, has, has convinced you of that, that, that Australopithecus is an ape, gorillas have always been gorillas, and we're not uh, very closely related to them genetically either. And still missing, even worse now, actually, at the end, as we come to the close of 2007, we don't have an ancestor. We don't have the common ancestor of humans and apes anymore because Lucy has fallen out. The gorilla has been around for, a lot, for 11 million years, which is about four three or four million years too long, it just doesn't work. <clears throat> so it leaves us with a question, and I want to finish with this question. Are we the son of an ape, or are we the son of God? And I want to finish with the words from the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. We are not sons of an ape. We're not descended from apes. We are, if anything, sons of God, creator God. And that concludes my talk. Now I'm ready to take questions. If you have questions... <clears throat>